This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My upcoming novel, Only the Dead, is available for pre-order right now, and it is narrated by Ray Porter, one of the guests on this podcast, along with narrator Scott Brick and the author of Narrator, Landon Beach. So now, without further ado, here's Landon Beach, Scott Brick, and Ray Porter. There he is. Hey! Hello. Oh, this is awesome. I am so fired up for this. It's great to see everybody. Good to see you. Oh, dude, I dig that sign. Yeah. Look at you. Not bad. He I has think it possibly the coolest office in the world. <laughs> Not yeah, bad. That recording studio is legit. Yeah, it's not oh bad. It's God. uh, you know, I wanted it to be not just a set. I wanted it to be a real office, a real room that I could come and work in, or I could watch if uh, someone had a, a show coming out, for, specifically for the podcast. It's like it's hard for me to sit down in our room with three kids and and people coming and going, dog, in laws, all that, and sit down in the front room and like watch a show that I need to come maybe take notes on or something like that because it doesn't look like work if you're sitting there with your feet up with the drink watching. TV. Uh, yeah. That's what exactly what it looks like to everybody else in the house who's like working and running and getting meals ready for the kids and all that stuff. So I come out here. So it's a space that I can uh, I can actually work in and then do podcasts in as well. So it's working Brilliant. out pretty well. Working out. But I wish we were here in person. There's two seats. I've done a couple in persons, but not very many. Um, and we're snowed in right now, so no one can even get up to the house. But uh, uh, this is the first time doing uh, doing uh, three people on uh, like this. Zoom or on the on uh, I think on video. I think my truck could get up to the house. Nice, nice. Yeah, some people can get up here, some people can't. And uh, Land Cruiser Brotherhood. <laughs> nice, nice. Wait, wait, which one did you get again? I remember when you I had the, it's been uh, like I have the uh, LX four seventy. Nice, nice. And that was it's been two years now, a year and a half, two years. Yeah, it's been about a year and a half, two years exactly. Awesome. And I'm doing little modifications here and there. Oh yes. And you're always thinking about the modifications, even if you're, you're not actually thinking about the thing you want to do next. Yes. Uh, as I was driving back up the hill today, I was thinking about the next things. I'm like, I might need to switch yeah. out a couple of lights here, but you're always, yeah. <laughs> oh, I remember being, you know, I'm from Michigan and uh, when it got cold and the, the winters that we had there, I remember it was time to put the chains on the wheels for our snowblower. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. You got to be careful about that. Uh, if we're good in our driveway without, with the tractor without chains, but if you try to go up a little bit like, to help somebody else out, then you need the chains and you got to, you know. I saw, I saw the video you posted on Instagram. Was that your, was that your wife? That is, I don't even know how to turn the thing on. That's just badass. I'm sorry. That's so cool. I'm up in my office that has a nice view of the driveway yeah, exactly. and my wife too. So I'll run down and make her an old fashioned or pour a glass of wine and run it out to her. She's because it's it's fairly large area that she Aerial has. Aerial shot of this tractor with a snowblower just clearing this. It's so cool. Yeah. She loves it. She takes her time away from the kids, away from me. It's quiet in there. There's Bluetooth. She can listen to an audiobook while she's uh, while she's doing that. Yeah. Oh, I might recommend one or two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you guys know any good narrators? <laughs> Do you get enough snow, Jack, where there where you have to shovel roofs? Because in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, it's literally a job. You have you, people get up there and you get one, you know, especially if it's you know, an angled roof, you get somebody on one side and you kind of tether each other and have to shovel roofs because there's so much snow and the weight that goes on there. Do you get anything like that out where you're at? Yeah, it's uh, we have the heat tape up there, but this season we have so much snow. I think it's the fourth or fifth um, largest amount of snow we've had in Utah ever in recorded history. And if we get four wow. more feet and it's snowing right now, uh, then we'll beat the, the record and it could be the number one um, recorded anyway uh, season. So, so we'll see. But yeah, there's one part of the roof where the heat tape doesn't get as much uh, maybe sunlight also. So there's one part that's a little precarious right now, yeah. right above the door, of course. So uh, nice. after this, I'm going to go out there and take another look at it and see about climbing up there or perhaps calling a professional to, <laughs> to handle that side of it uh, so that I can, uh, can, can type away <laughs> instead of getting swept off the roof in some sort of a landslide, snow slide, avalanche. But uh, I've, been, I've been so looking forward to this. I'm so thank you guys all for taking the time. Uh, of course, Ray's been on here twice before, narrates my audio book. We're good friends. Uh, it's great to see you. And Scott, Happy we met. Happy to be here. Oh, thank, thank you so much for taking the time. I have that same shirt by the way i'm glad i didn't wear it today this the, one no, the, the this one the uh flannel oh yeah 
So nice. I got that saying, well, we could have been twins. Uh, oh, and, that would have been awkward. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Scott, we met at what Men of Mystery. Um, it's a writer's yeah. author's conference in, uh, in Long, Long Beach. Beach. I want to say. Yeah, well, in Long Beach. Yeah. Uh, a couple of years ago, 2019. Yep. So before everything, oh, the right, world right changed. Before everything shut down. Yeah. So I got to got to meet you there, and you were doing an event with uh, Greg Hurwitz, whose books Greg, you also sure. uh, narrate. Um, and, uh, oh, my gosh, Landon, this is great to meet you for the first time. And I know we share a little yeah, naval, naval history in common. And I wanted to ask you about that because you're very vague about it on your website and in the back of your uh, your book here. It just says you were uh, a naval officer. And then that leave it at that. So, uh, Well, I hate to spoil it. No, nothing top secret, brother. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. What did you do? So I was a surface warfare officer. So I was on uh, DGG 64, uh, the Kearney. And then I was on the Samuel Elliott Morrison. We did a foreign sale actually to Turkey. And I ended my career on the Estotian FFG 15. And then I was a NROTC assistant professor of naval science at Purdue for my shore tour. Uh, and then uh, got out and uh, became a teacher uh, before uh, this little gig. Yeah, and you were a teacher for over a decade, right? Fifteen years in the in the trenches, sir. Okay, what did you uh, what did you do? What grades did you teach? What were you What were you doing? I taught um, seniors all fifteen years, uh, and I taught AP literature and composition, creative writing, film analysis, speech, SAT prep. Uh, kind of ran the ran the gauntlet there. Okay, okay. And during that time, you start writing. Is that is that how that worked out? Yeah, I was writing when I was in the military, actually, before uh, I, I got in the classroom. And then uh, later on, uh, you know, it, it led to this. Yeah. And and then uh, those first books came out while you were still teaching. And then you've recently just gone all in on the, the writing front. Yes, sir. That's how it went down. Nice, nice. I love it. Well, I love this book, by the way. Uh, this was so much fun for me to read, uh, especially being in this industry now and, uh, uh, knowing Ray and, uh, it, and it's just, it's, it was, I was so, I had a smile on my face. And you've been to the, the whole time. Jack, I've been to the Oddies. Yeah. yeah. So I'm man. reading the Oddies in, in here, of course, I'm reading yeah. that, uh, Steven Spielberg shows that he wasn't at ours. Was he Ray? Spielberg wasn't presenting at ours. He wasn't I don't think. there, but he's, he, he's presenting in this, uh, Oprah wasn't at ours either. I don't think, um, no. but yeah, it was I awesome. Think they are Woody. <laughs> I think they have, they have, maybe they have other things going on. Um, uh, but that was so much fun. We got to get, put the tuxes on, and that's where we got to no, link up for the first super time. Cool. You got to dress up and stuff. Yep, yep. I don't think no I, I was, flannel to be seen anywhere. No, no, unfortunately not. But it was fun, fun to dress up. We got to hang out, have some drinks. Yeah, um, it was, it was and uh, we didn't win. We didn't win that year. Uh, you that's have won, great. of course, both of you guys. Um, I mean, in, incredible. Um, but uh, Ruth Ware, I think, won our our year. Um, I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Terminal List was up for not audiobook of the year uh, and narrator of the of the year for that for that and the Ruth Ware book um, I think won that year. But it was so much fun just to be there. Oh my gosh, that was, was that great. was fantastic. Uh, it was great meeting everybody. It was the first time I met the whole audio crew from Simon and Schuster as well. Um, yeah. Because it's such a team. And I wanted to ask you guys about that too, because I know a little bit about Ray's process. Uh, I don't know as much, Scott, about your process. And I wanted to ask you both because um, uh, people might not have listened to our podcast together, Ray. And I get a lot of emails, questions about audiobooks, uh, uh, hours uh, in general. And sometimes yeah. I don't, you know, I don't know. I know how to answer a lot of them, but um, but there's some that just, I don't don't know how to answer. Just text me, man. I'll give you the answer <laughs> and you can take credit. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, like there's some things in here I didn't know about um, uh, naked audiobook reading. Is that a real yeah. term? Is that, uh, is that real or is that something, Landon, that you, you made up? <laughs> Uh, and we yeah, should explain took, it fairly uh, quickly for people art. that think these guys are naked in the license. booth. <laughs> I took many artistic liberties with certain sections in the book, but uh, most of the stuff in there uh, has definitely been, you know, researched. And uh, the part, you know, that really strikes me about the book was just how ignorant I was of the process before I started looking into it. And it was over a year of research, Jack. And I had no idea all the things that go into the craft and art and science of audiobooks that Ray and Scott do. I mean, I, I knew that I appreciated what they did and how they sounded, but that's always when the consumer gets it at the finished product level. But to know behind the scenes what it takes to actually 
narrate and the decisions that they make, sometimes on a sentence by sentence, word by word level, um, it just gave me a whole new appreciation for it. And one of the byproducts, even though it's a psychological thriller, is it did turn out to be a love letter of sorts just to storytelling because yeah. when you think of the origins of it, all of us around, you know, the campfire and our Neolithic forebears, uh, long before you've got the written word, before you've got radio, before you've got silent film or, you know, the talkies that we have now. And so, uh, yeah, it was quite an experience digging into it. Um, and then the key was, how do you make that a part of the book without making it sound like a Wikipedia page where you're just detailing what exactly goes uh, into narration and dramatize it? And so that was a, a big challenge because <laughs> you don't want to lose the reader or listener. But yeah, yeah it was. I, well, I you succeeded was, in that. It, it was, was such a fun, such a fun read and such a fun listen. Oh my gosh. I started listening and I love the brick by brick. Well, first, before I go there, what's, um, Naked, uh, you would describe it in the book as not having the headphones on. So doing it without the headphones. Is that a real term, uh, Ray and Scott? Is that a real thing? I've, n I've never heard that term. I've always heard it employed to if it's a really, really, really hot day in the booth, one might explore <laughs> naked uh, audiobook. <laughs> one might. Uh, one, one might. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know anyone who lives in a home-built booth in Pasadena, California in the middle of summer who's narrated a book in his shorts but uh anyway <laughs> um no but i know that there's a there's a lot of narrators who prefer to not wear uh headphones i do because uh this is a fairly loud area of town mm -hmm. and uh, the mic will pick up things that my ears can't yeah so yeah. i tend to i tend to wear earphones when i record nice scott when what do you I do go, when i go to a somebody else's studio um penguin random house uh i will go naked uh okay uh, figuratively speaking um i don't want to hear the headphones but i can trust them to have a really quiet booth right uh, yeah in, in my <laughs> own booth i live uh kind of in the flight path to as as ray was saying um i live in a nice quiet neighborhood but it is in the flight path to the van nuys airport okay yeah. so um or is, I guess it's actually Burbank. Uh, anyway, whatever. The plane's going overhead and uh, uh, leaf blowers outside when the gardeners come in the neighborhood. And um, what I typically do is go about halfway. You got the headphones. I'll put it on one ear and I and I put it behind my ear on the other side so I can still hear ambient noises. You know, do I, okay, there's a gardener over there. Do I need to, you know, go back right. and do that take? Got it. Yeah. Interesting. Because I was in here, uh, we have uh, sound dampening things in the roof and, and all that stuff. So it's a, it's, uh, well, it's, of course it, it, it's not, I mean, it's really nice, but, uh, but so there's an option when, when there are, I like to have them on here, but when I have people live over here in the chairs, there's an option not to. And, uh, so yeah. someone didn't, was like, oh, let's not have them on. And then as soon as we start, of course, my wife fires up the tractor and I'm like, ah, <laughs> this is why I have them on. Because if you have yeah. those on, you don't hear that, you know, the mic might pick it up a little bit, but we can take care of that afterward. Um, but it just keeps you in the conversation without thinking, oh my gosh, how long is she going to keep the tractor warming up outside for, or, uh, or somebody shows up and parks outside or whatever it might be. So I do like having them on, even when I have people right here in, uh, in studio, even though it's not completely necessary. I will also I will also employ headphones just um, for me uh so that I have more um control if you will uh, particularly when you're doing a bunch of different voices and a bunch of different accents when there's stuff about inflection when you know tone and things like that I prefer it's a little like having a magnifying glass in a way and that's mm. why I prefer wearing the earphones for that sort of thing too I, Ray, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. Um, I had it uh, at Random House years ago, before they merged with Penguin. Um, there was a, an editor named Mitch Plesner, and um, lovely guy. And um, my, I had recorded a book at home and sent it in. And, you know, they got, they've got 10 booths out there now. Yeah. And so, you know, he's, how do you keep track of everything that's going on? Every book that's being recorded that sometimes there you know there are days where you got three books going on in one studio so it's like so he says to me one time he says uh hey this title did you do that here i said no he said did you do it at home i said yeah 
He said, so you were wearing headphones? I said, yeah. He said, yeah, I could tell. Yeah. And I said, why? <laughs> he said, because you're a lot more aware of your own performance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that you, He's like, you're stopping and starting more. He says, you're not as free as you are when you're not wearing headphones. And I think, frankly, I think it was because of that, that I, uh, it kind of, so that's funny I, I mean, for going without for me i found the opposite to be true i i um if i've got the headphones on i don't have to think about and self-monitor in that way i'm able to just you know i've got i've got all of the gauges in front of me and i can just drive the damn car you know um as opposed to i, I guess it feels like working without a net if i don't have the headphones on and so i'm self-auditing more yeah. If I'm going without headphones, you know, you know what this is reminding me of. Weird, but you know, I am weird. Well, look, Jack, you you were just talking about you know the peek into the booth, right? You know, and 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 Landon just saying you know he's done a you know a, did a year's worth of research on this. I'm reminded of this great old story where the uh, great uh, uh, British actor, uh, um, uh, and of course now I'm blanking on his name, um, uh, turn of the last century. Uh, Ralph Richardson, pardon me, Ralph Richardson. He uh, he was he found himself on a London train, probably around World War One era, and he had a script. He was doing a stage production and he was memorizing his lines. And across across the train from him, there was this very grand regal actor from the late you know nineteenth century, and he had a walking stick. And he reached out and whacked it out of Ralph Richardson's hand. And Richardson looks like, what the hell are you doing? And he <laughs> says, he says, never let them see the work. Right. Mm. And it's something that, uh, you know, magicians work their entire life to make sure that, you know, you're looking at this pretty thing that they're doing over here and you're not paying attention to the actual work that's going on back Precisely. here. Precisely. You know? I don't think it's I don't it's it's mm -hmm. fun to have a brief window in but to really fully learn how the sausages get made. <laughs> right. I think really does kind of detract from the end product. Plus I don't know if uh, I mean your mileage may vary Scott but I have found in conversations with other narrators the process, the equipment the software you record on, everything is as different as it possibly could be. Mm -hmm. It's like every narrator's process is kind of like their own fingerprint. I cannot tell you how many times, Jack, Landon, uh, you know, uh, Landon, I feel bad because I don't think I ever described this term to you when we were talking during the research stage. But almost every narrator, producer, publisher asks the same question. So what's your signal chain look like? Yep. You know, what kind of preamp are you using? What kind of microphone do you have? Absolutely. What's, what size and shape is your booth? Um, you know, yeah. are you using a tube mic? Or, you know, everything. They want to know where the sound goes from here to here to here, you know, from, from the mouth to here to here to here to the focus right to the claret, you know, uh, ultimately to the Internet. And um, it's, yeah, it is as, I, you're right, right? It's as unique as your fingerprint. Wow. Yeah. It's so fascinating. Yeah. Did uh, did, you, did you guys have home booths before COVID or was that something that happened after? I did, yeah. You did. I think yeah. you did too, right, Scott? Yeah, I uh, I bought my house in 2006. And uh, in 2008, I, uh, I licensed my favorite books of all time that had never been done on audio. And I'm like, well, hell, I could publish these myself. Why not? <laughs> And uh, to be honest, uh, it was Dan Musselman at Random House at the time who said to me, hey, look, you know, I asked him if I could rent his studio so I could record these books. And he goes, if you did, you'd be spending like five grand. How about you take five grand and you just put a booth into your into your into your house? Mm -hmm. So thankfully, Ray and I and a number of our colleagues were in a really good position when COVID hit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did that. upgrade my booth. I got a better booth during COVID, but yeah, I've been recording at home since, for 15 years at that point. Got it. Got yeah. it. Yeah. That, so I did. So I have so much respect for you. I did before, but then I recorded the preface, a new preface to uh, the terminal list when the show, when the show came out, we did a, a hardcover 
release. And I wrote a, a preface that talked about how it came to be, how the book came to be, how the show came to be and, and all that. And we, we put some pictures in here. So, um, so special, just limited edition for, for the show and yeah. just recording the press. So it's like five pages, the preface, maybe, maybe a little more. It's pretty long, maybe five, six, seven, eight here. Um, so I built a little studio real quick uh, off the former podcast studio, which was upstairs, ran the cord under the, the uh, closet that's attached there. Um, so put the microphone in there, had a chair, uh, started hanging clothes until the, the audio people at Simon & Schuster said that, okay, that's good um, to absorb some of that of that sound and then yes. close the door. And I had to read it. I mean, I wrote it. Uh, it's not very long. It's not, I don't, there's no character voices. It's just me reading it. And I had the director in my ear and uh, that is so difficult. And that's the easiest thing somebody can read right there. It's, it's no accents. Don't have to remember anything. Uh, don't have to remember a name associated with an accent that someone's now talking that was introduced 500 pages ago or something. Um, it is extremely difficult. Uh, so now I even have more respect for what you guys do. I can't even believe it. It's incredible. It's absolutely so incredible. So years ago, I had the uh, the Wall Street Journal had first noticed audiobooks and they wanted to do an immersive article and they and they flew somebody out a uh, lovely man and uh um he wanted to shadow me for the whole day and to see you know day in the life of a narrator kind of kind of article uh -huh. and uh while we were at the studio he asked me a question uh he said would it be possible for me to see what it's like if I, if I actually went into the booth would that be possible if I read a page or two just to get it kind of you know Mm -hmm. understand this really you know how it feels and i really respected that because i i wrote 300 magazine articles in three years and got burned out that was before i started narrating but i you know i had done a number of you know day in the life of articles like that and yeah. and i never would have thought of asking that and so lovely man he had just sold his first novel and so as dan musselman was setting him up uh, uh in the booth uh, uh, William, he says, you know, what, what should I, uh, what should I read? And Dan says, well, then you just sell a novel. Yeah. He goes, do you have a copy? And he goes, can I use your printer? And he prints <laughs> out the first two pages. Yeah. He goes and he puts two pages down. He, he proceeds to narrate it. And he walked out and I swear to God, he had sweated through his, his yep. clothes. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> just because. It, it, it's just the fear of never having done something. It's simple. I mean, you know, easy for us to say it's simple. We've done it a thousand times. But to sit down in a new environment, and even though you're just, you know, you're going chapter one and going until the end, reading aloud, if you've never done it, it can be terrifying. And it's also deceptively difficult. I will say, that, you know, <laughs> uh, the thing about being an audiobook narrator is that almost daily you're, you're, confronted with someone coming up saying well i like to read and my my aunt tells me i have a nice voice maybe i should narrate audiobooks and my stock answer is <laughs> maybe you should because, <laughs> good luck well it's it's once you once you get into it once you start doing it you realize how difficult it is mentally physically oh. I mean, you know, listen, I used to do construction. It ain't real work, you know, <laughs> but at the same time, it, it, it actually kind of is. I did oh, yeah. a play with Tom Hanks a number of years ago, and he related this, uh, having to narrate his own book of short stories. And he went on about just how fatiguing it was at the end of the day. Oh. And he was like, and how many, how many books have you done? I was like, I, I don't know, around 500. He's like, how? <laughs> you know, he's getting his head around that, you know, so it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's always surprises people with how tired you can be just oh. at the end of the day. It's wild. One of, my, one of my favorite Ray Porter stories. I just have to do this. Oh God. Um, I went and saw that production. He and Tom Hanks did a production. It was, uh, uh, Henry the fourth one and two Henry the fourth. Yeah. Henry uh -huh. fourth, both parts in one evening. Yes. It was a marvelous production. Here in los angeles uh five six years ago yeah and um um <laughs> and he and tom stayed in touch there but you know he he likely won't tell you this but there's been times where ray has had a question you know and like hey tom you know a little acting advice audition advice what have you and tom gets back to him um <laughs> uh 
soon thereafter, somebody did an article about me and they called me the Tom Hanks of audiobooks. Ray texted me and says, oh, and to think that I know the Scott Brick of film. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> that is fantastic. And both you guys are Shakespearean trained actors and you spent, Ray spent time in, in Oregon and, and yeah. Scott, you're in, Cal you're in California, but you spent a number of years on the stage. And I don't know if people realize just how much acting goes in to narrating. I mean, it is an acting job, essentially. That's why all those uh, films that are animation have actors doing the voices for the most part. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, you are acting in these in all these parts. One of the great things about Shakespeare is that if you're going to have any success with it at all, you come pretty quickly to realize that the single most important and only thing is the text, mm. which prepares you marvelously for this kind of work where it really is just about the text. It's less about you, more about the text, about conveying the the book or whatever it is you're doing. And, uh, you know, it, it, people ask me what kind of vocal prep I do, and I'm like, I did 18 years <laughs> during forest fires wearing three-pile wool in a 1,200-seat theater. I think my voice will be fine, you know. Yeah. But um, it really, it, your relationship to text changes when you have when you do any performance of classics particularly shakespeare i find i think it's a great tool to have yeah i think i think it also prepares you and i i know this is something that uh, that landon uh, would appreciate simply because one of the earliest things he and i bonded over was our mutual love of shakespeare uh, uh, whether you've noticed it jack or not mm -hmm. almost I, I think every single book that he's written that I've narrated, <laughs> there's been at least one Shakespearean quote in mm -hmm. it. And, um, uh, and of course, narrators is, uh, is no different, but um, the thing that I think it prepares you for working on Shakespeare, doing it on stage, what it prepares you to do as a narrator is to learn when to um dishonor the text and i know i'm speaking to two writers and so let me let me define my terms like um dishonoring the text uh, primarily for me that means punctuation because punctuation doesn't exist i mean let's be honest there's no such thing as punctuation in human speech what there are are full stops what there are are you know easing into a stop you know, when you, it, it, what would be an ellipses, you know, three dots as you're like, uh, run out of things to say, you know, or you have, you have pauses, you have period. These, these are implied. This is a man-made creation, a publisher made creation, let's say yeah. uh, it, a publisher enforced <clears throat> creation that makes you do certain things. Like if you were going to um, ask a rhetorical question, you have to by form, add the question mark. But if you were going to be slavish to the text, you could say this line this way. Who do you think you are anyway? Mm. You have to learn at what point it yeah. serves the, the listening experience to interpret. Yeah. Okay, I know that this is what the author intended. Right. Maybe I don't put the comma here. It's easier for the performance if I put it there. The comma is still there. It's just moving it a, a you know a word or two yeah. just to make it more understandable, listenable for the audience. And sometimes I think it sometimes it helps drive the action to ignore a full stop, even as written, a period or something, in the name of getting to that concept. Yeah, yeah. totally dishonoring yeah. the text. I love that. Yeah. No, I love that term. It, uh, and I, I don't know if this is an urban myth or not, but I heard that Christopher Walken uh, has all the punctuation taken out of his scripts. Um, and if you think of Christopher Walken <laughs> said, that wouldn't delivering <laughs> yeah. lines or a monologue, um, it, uh, it, you can kind of you can kind of see it. I don't know if that's true or not. All right, today I want to talk about Protect.com. That is P R O T E K T. Dot com started by my buddy Nick Norris from the SEAL teams who was recently on the podcast. He's all about health and wellness and living that best life. So what we have here, hydration, immunity, energy, rest, liquid packs. Because we all want to feel our best. We dream of waking up with plenty of energy to excel at our work, our personal lives, and have a great workout every single day. But the reality is 
Very few of us do that. That's why Protect was started. And you can grab a convenient pack right here. This is energy. So this has been boosting me through my latest novel. And look at that, it's a liquid pack right there. You just, bam, add it to a glass, add a little water, and you are good to go. So hydration, love the hydration, and the immunity, and the clarity, which I'm gonna take as soon as this podcast is over and I get back to writing. So all of that plus the rest. How important is that rest? Right here, take that an hour and a half before bed for some great sleep. And for hydration right here, 30 minutes after you wake up and right before your workout. So swap that daily energy drink for the energy. Try that hydration, that immunity, that rest. And they also have products like this, Reef Safe Sunscreen, SPF 50. Protect right there. And right now you can get 25% off. Go to protect.com. That is P-R-O-T-E-K-T.com slash danger close for 25% off. Go check them out. Landon, this, man, so I read a lot of books and very rarely do I read one where I'm like, oh man, I wish I had that idea. This one is one of those those books where I'm like, this is fantastic, such a fun read. Um, when did you first get the idea to uh, write a book? Uh, well, I mean, the title says a lot about it, but where did this where did this come from? And then how did you link up with with Scott? And uh, I do have a lot of questions, but this is fantastic. Absolutely love it. It was so much fun. Um, but how did you first get the idea? How long did it take? from you having that idea to actually putting the, the pen to paper? And then yeah. how did uh, how did you link up with uh, with Scott to, to start this journey? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm humbled by what you just said. Thanks, Jack. It means a lot to have a writer like you uh, appreciate that work. So appreciate that, brother. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I would say before I answer that is goes back to what Scott and Ray were talking about, that how different narrators have different kind of rituals and different equipment and things that they do to prepare. And some people swear by, you know, doing vocal exercises to, you know, warm up beforehand. And there are others that go into the booth, maybe just after having you know drunk a lot of water and start that way. And so one question I do get is, Hey, you know, is Sean Frost Scott Brick? <laughs> well, you, you dedicate you dedicate the book to to Scott, which was really yeah, cool to see that. I know. Also. And I'll get to why I dedicated it to him in a, in a minute. But I said, no, he's not. What I did was, after all the research, I kind of built his character with different techniques that different narrators use, so that he would be, you know, his own person. Um, there are some things that Sean does that Scott does, and there are other things that he does that that he doesn't. And so <laughs> that's it was good to know to kind of to build that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there are many things and faults that Sean has, and I'm glad Scott does not have either. No <laughs> cane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was an option. Wait a minute. Uh, what? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, I was like, was that a blue straw behind you, Scott? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, it, it really it was about 20 years um, in the making, Jack, because I've been writing uh, for a long time before I put any of my work forward. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to do an entertainment comeback story. You know, Scott and I, you know, we have a love of Shakespeare and of film and became really good friends once we noticed that we had a lot of those things in common. But I could never quite figure out how to tell it because so much had been done before. And if you think of it this way, I put this in the author's note, it was vertigo, play misty for me, misery, a beautiful mind, and then a short story called The Continuity of Parks by Julio Cortazar. And I would even throw in at this point too, looking back on it, Romancing the Stone probably influenced me as well. I was thinking about that as I was listening to, to Scott narrate it, uh, especially yeah, in those beginning, beginning parts, because the it's the beginning of the story and she's you narrating. You're it's in fantastic. one of Joan Wilder's, yep. you know, and I was like, this is you know really cool. And then Scott and I signed an initial uh, three book contract. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But what happened was when I heard him read those and narrate those first three stories, all of a sudden it clicked. And I said, you know, I don't think anyone has ever written a thriller or psychological thriller with an audiobook narrator as the main character, because 
you know, in Misery, it was an author who got kidnapped. You've got a disc jockey in Play Misty for me. It's really hard. And, and you know this as well within, you know, the books that you write to come up with something that the audience hasn't seen before so that they don't kind of peace out after 100 pages and start flipping to go, well, here, where's something that I haven't seen? Mm-hmm. And that's a real challenge to not be repetitive. And so... At that point, I was still working on my Great Lakes saga, and I laugh now because when I finished the fourth one, at the end of that audiobook, Scott says, you know, coming soon by Brick by Brick Audiobooks, The Bay in 2021, and it's 2023 right now, and I haven't started it yet. (laughs) And so I pushed everything else to the side, and I didn't say a word to Scott because naturally I was really intimidated approaching him because this is his livelihood and he's a master of his craft and I didn't want it to fall into being a parody I wanted to really show that respect um, and at the same time have something that would entertain everyone and so I started researching researching and then I finally got to the point where I was ready to write and I had some questions for him and so how I got introduced to Scott was when I got to the point in my business where I wanted to expand into audiobooks, um, I started researching, you know, um, what that would look like. And my wife asked me, you know, well, is there anybody you have in mind who you'd like to perform your books? And to make a long story short, uh, I had been a fan of Scott's for years, but I listened to him for the very first time when we were, I was back in the military and I was stationed in Mayport and we were traveling from Um, Florida up to Michigan to visit family as we did whenever we had the chance. And my wife got some audio books a few trips before, and we really got hooked on David Baldacci's series um, with Sean King uh, and Michelle Maxwell. And the new one had just come out. This is back in 2007. And we're traveling. We just get across the state border into Georgia. And I told her, I said, pause this. I said, who is that? <laughs> and she's like, I, I don't know. I go, this, I'm in a trance here. The guy is amazing. And she turned over the you know CD copies that we had. And she said, Scott Brick. And so back in 2007, um, I you know was just enamored with this. And what, so now fast forward to 2019. And she says, who are you thinking of going with? I said, do you remember that guy 12 years ago that we listened to going up to Michigan from Florida? And so I did some research and I looked online and Scott is also an entrepreneur. And so he was working with a couple of indies at that point, Jack. And I looked at them and I was, I got excited at first. And then I looked, oh, well, these are million copy seller indies. Um, But I had placed in a few international writing contests at that point for the rec and for the sale, my first two books. And I said, I thought my resume was at a point. I said, let's go for it. And so I contacted his amazing production manager, Gina Smith. And I said, you know, would would Scott take a look at this? And she reached out to Scott and said, and I'll never forget the email. I said, you know, send the rec. Scott will take a look at it. And if we're interested, uh, we'll let you know. And I had, you know, a week of sleepless nights. (laughs) wondering if, you know, he was going to actually be interested in this. And then I got the email back and said, absolutely, Scott, we'll do this one and we'll do a three book deal. So then get to the point now where this would have been our sixth collaboration together. And by this point, we've become really good friends. And Scott, you know, it means a lot to me, not only as a narrator, but as a, as a good buddy. And I ran the idea by him on a Zoom. We were actually in a pre-recording conference for Here on Breeze, which was a murder mystery that I had written. And at the very end of it, I said, you know, Scott, uh, do do you mind if I ask you a few questions? (laughs) And he said, well, sure. What's up? And you know how it is in Zooms, Jack? You know, we're multitasking. We're looking at things. And he was working on something. He was typing. And I said, well, I've got this idea, you know, maybe about a narrator uh, who gets kidnapped and tortured. (laughs) I remember his eyes. He's just like, ah, <laughs> looked at me, and I'm like, I was like, oh shoot. So I had ten questions, and then the crazy thing happened. We got through four of them, and the power went out right in the middle of it. Of course. <laughs> and so I'm sitting in my room here in the office in the dark, going, "My God, what is Scott Brick thinking right now of me and this story?" And then we got back to together, and uh, he's like you know, sure, we'll, we'll see what happens. And like he said many times, you know, when you, a lot of people have ideas, but 
rarely ever in this business for many of them do they ever end up being a full artistic product you know there's many promises and whatnot and so then I went away and I wrote it we hadn't talked for months and then I emailed him and I said Scott would you would you like to take a look at the first draft of this and so that's how that's how it happened that's how we got hooked up how we became friends and how we got to work on this and the level of coordination I think collaboration is a weird word because he has his turf and I have mine, of course, but this one without the friendship and the trust with each other. Um, I, I don't know if this one would have been possible, but now looking back, I don't see this project without it. Um, yeah. You know, it, it took that kind of level because for 99% of the people that would read or listen to the book, they might not catch some of those insider mistakes, but we wanted to make sure that the 1% who arguably is a big audience for the book as kind of a respectful letter to them and appreciative. Um, we wanted them to never get taken out of the read as well. Yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic. And Scott, brick by brick product. Is that your, that's your, I mean, I love the name. When I heard that pop up, I was like, Oh, fantastic. I'm like, he must have his own, his own thing going, um, in the beginning. And then whose voice is it that introduces you? Is that, is that, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. This is, this is the story I wanted to tell. Oh. So, uh, uh, uh <laughs> Please do. Like, is it Ray? I'm like, who is that? I'm like, I was trying to listen. I'm like, is it Scott just doing a voice? Or is it like, like well, who is this person? Yeah, somebody emailed me and they said, they're like, Landon Beach, is that Ray Porter? And so I wrote back, I was just said, dark side is everywhere. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Well, look, when I when I got the copy, uh, uh, Landon sent me a, a hard copy to look at. And it wasn't the final. And he asked me, could you take a look? And if there's anything like glaring errors, can you let me know? Maybe we can address it. And and I and and going back to what he had said, yeah, collaboration is a tricky word, but there was there was input. He was asking for input. And so the smallest thing, like, you know, uh, do you actually say, you know, um, I hit the record button and then I proceeded? And I'm like, well, there is no record button it's the number three on my, on my keyboard. It's yeah. a shortcut, you know? And he goes, Oh, well, if I said I hit record, is that something that said, yes, we say that all day, every day. It's just little tiny things oh, like yeah. that. And he was always open to, you know, trying to refine it. And, um, but it was, it was so weird because yes, he had interviewed me. He had asked me these questions and I didn't <laughs> realize there were times I was going to be directly quoted. And <laughs> at, at one point, Sean, uh, Sean Frost, the main character, says, people ask me all the time, what's it like being a famous audiobook narrator? And I remember a colleague of mine once said, it's like being the tallest midget in the room. <laughs> and I went, that's me. That's a Scott my colleague is me all day long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, if Sean Frost is a narrator, then he is my colleague and I am his. He's <laughs> quoting me. <laughs> I think it, it was at that moment that I realized I, I was I was going to be uh, uh, reading some of my own lines aloud uh, just a handful of times. But it was when uh, when I read this lovely uh, uh, dedication, <laughs> then I knew I was going to call my buddy Ray because look, my company is called Brick by Brick Audiobooks, right? It's the publishing arm of 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 what I do. I don't need any help to seem self centered. <laughs> so I knew I couldn't read these nice things about me myself. So I called Ray and I said, dude, SAG after contract, man, here you go. Um, you know, intro, outro. Uh, there was a handful of things that he, I think he did the author's note at the right. end. Yes. Nice. So anything, said, anything to help my friend give the illusion of humility. <laughs> Yeah, but but what it's I fantastic. love about the fact is that technically, I've paid friends of mine to say nice things about me. <laughs> yes, he has. <laughs> By definition, he has. Oh my gosh, that is fantastic. And Ray was he was reading the manuscript of it at that point. Um, yeah. Gave you know a, a wonderful blurb. So you know, anyways, Ray for the first time, sort of face to face. Hello and thank you, brother. Oh, you're more than welcome, man. 
Uh, so cool. More than welcome. That no, was awesome. Really that was a surprise. Fun. I didn't, I didn't uh, expect that. So that was really cool to, to hear as I was, uh, was listening to it. Uh, hey, Scott, what were those ones that, those books that you um, optioned on your own? Was that when you, how you started your Brick by Brick? Was it uh, oh, yeah. by optioning um, and, those? And around? I also, again, just to not seem as self-centered, <laughs> I actually didn't come up with that, with that name myself. Did Ray? My best, my best friend, Richard, was like, it's Brick by Brick. Yeah, it's a good I, one. Yeah, I mean, oh it is God. kind of a no-brainer, right? Yeah, I was like, how did I miss that? Um, <laughs> but yes, uh, those were the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant by Stephen R. Donaldson. It's a fantasy series. Okay. Um, I, I I sacrificed my grades my freshman year of college so that I could finish the second trilogy and figure out just what happened. Um, they're brilliant. And I actually went to the publishers and I said, hey, any interest? And they didn't have any. So I said, okay, I've got a studio. I've got money. I could, I've got a lawyer and she could, you know, send him my check. And uh, yeah, that was uh, about 15 years ago. And it's turned into a really wonderful relationship. It's very interesting um, becoming friends with the authors that you work with. Uh, delighted to say that uh, uh, that reflects equally on this conversation as well. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot, somebody that you've, you know, whose work you've admired for so long. It's like, Oh, good load of me. I got that <laughs> phone number in my contacts list. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's okay. so cool. Oh, that's fantastic. And, uh, is the, did you make up Landon? Is it the counter? Do you guys have that counter that you talk about? I wrote the name of it, of it down, but is that a real thing when you're like, Oh, I need to go back or I need to let production the know clicker. the clicker, the, yeah, the clicker. clicker. Yeah. Is that a real thing? What, what is that? It is indeed. Um, if you've ever gone into like a small nightclub setting, yeah, a place where they may have, uh, you know, uh, you, you got to keep track of it for, you know, fire, fire laws, you know, mm -hmm. the 280 seat maximum. Um, as you go in through the front door, you got somebody who sits there with a little round metal thing in his hand. And ch -ch 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 -ch. every time somebody goes to the turnstiles, that's what they do. And when, when they get to 280, they're like, sorry, folks. Mm -hmm. And unless somebody walks out, nobody else walks in. They're $5 on Amazon. And basically what it is, you know, I hold it up next to the microphone. And when I make a mistake, um, you know, you've got, you've got a waveform basically in the, in the recording software. Okay. Uh, ordinarily, if, if there's no talking, it's, it's just a, a horizontal line. It's like an EKG, mm -hmm. but the heartbeat is, you know, the words that we speak, but you hit that clicker and it will peak. It gets really high, really low. Mm. So all my editor has to do is go in afterwards and look for those peaks and just cut out everything in between. Oh, interesting. And Ray, do you use one of those? Not at all. I do. Uh, I do what they call punch and roll. So um, I now back in the day when I was first starting, I had a rather novel way of achieving that spike in the waveform. This was when I first started narrating. <clears throat> I was in a converted garage and I would start, I would hit record on my computer and walk back to the closet get in there, slide the door. This is back when the audiobooks came in paper. So you'd get this 80 pound box of, you know, FedEx. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, I, so I couldn't easily stop, go back, set my cursor and, you know, record over the mistakes. So I needed to mark the mistakes. I didn't know about the clicker. So I used a really percussive word starting with F. <laughs> <laughs> And it was fine. It, it worked really great until, until I missed a couple <laughs> and an engineer contacted me and was like, you okay, dude? <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, man. And when we, we put I, that in, Jack, it was, um, you know, Scott said, this is one of the places where we talked about it. Yeah. And he said, you know, I don't know if people will know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Because That's how I pictured. I pictured the actual, that. the clicker, just like you said, from the bar, but I hadn't yeah, heard so of it he, being used in this way. So he put it, he, he told his engineer, leave that in, um, because we're going to demonstrate that. And then later on, there were a couple other places where he went through the whole routine with Sean and you can, you know, hear him dabbing, you know, the chapstick and taking the drink of water and, you know, yeah. everything that goes yeah. with it. And it was cool, but we, we got to the end because <laughs> the clicker we got, you know, we're trying to get 
the book out at a certain date because one, we had recorded a couple of these interviews that we're going to drop on the actual day that, so we're under pressure here. I, I got COVID at that point. And, mm. you know, as a quick side story, one of the, the thing that I remember most about narrator actually has nothing to do with the book, but it was when one thing that Scott and I do, which is different probably from traditional publishing is that he will send me the files uh, ahead of time and he has his proofers, but I do a proof as well. Mm. And on this one, we would, you know, we both listened to them and thought about here, here's something we could tweak here. Here's something we could tweak here to make it better. And so he had given me the first 25 chapters or whatnot. And then I came down with COVID and I wrote him back and I said, I, I've got COVID and this is, you know, maybe going to put this back a little bit. And I said, you know, cause my go-to when I'm sick and I can't read is I watch old movies mm -hmm. And so I was watching Key Largo with Bogey. And I said, I said, bye, buddy. I'll, I'll be back in touch with you. <laughs> you know, I'm watching Key Largo right now. And I'll never forget it. I put my phone away. I'm like, <laughs> you know, worst sore throat I've had in my life. And all of a sudden my phone buzzes and I pick it up. And I'm like, I look at it. And Scott had made a four minute audio recording for me um wishing me well to get better but also too an inside story about key largo and bogey and at the end you know just had you know talked about a few things uh, that i might want to consider uh you know an oximeter and whatnot oh, uh, recovering nice. from covid so I, I remember that um more than anything and i said man what what a good dude this guy is this is this is really awesome and then to get back to the clicker because that put us back a little bit. And then there was an audiobook conference coming up that I wanted to have stuff there. And I'm paying a lot of money to send it there and fly it there. And Scott's going to be there when it, the weekend that it launches. But we got right down to the end and I'm going through the last files and I'm listening to one of the final chapters and there's like click, 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 click. And I'm like, I wrote him like, I'm like, I'm like, Bricky, we got clicks on chapter 25. <laughs> and he's just like, he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I'm like, no, we, we got clicks on 25. And so he had to go in there and yeah, we finally got it figured out. And uh, when it got sent and we actually made the pub date and he went to the conference and I had the poster that one just like this behind mm -hmm. me set up and people that it was the first weekend that it came out and other narrators are coming up to Scott. And I remember he told me this, he says, they're just like, Scott, can I, can I talk to you for a minute? Can I pull you over to the side? So he's like, sure. So he goes over and they say, dude, is this real? Is this fake? <laughs> Did you actually record this? <laughs> it's like, it was kind of like, you know, um, oh my gosh, Kurt Vonnegut, when they had a, an ugly fan letter that accused him of not being real. And he wrote back a response that, you know, is now legendary. We said, I'm Kurt Vonnegut. I am real. <laughs> That's fantastic. Oh, man. Uh, and, you know, this is really special for me because if people, you know, you guys won't say it about yourselves, but um, if if there were a period uh, pyramid in the uh, audiobook narration world, these two guys are at the top. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really special for me to be able to sit down um, with you guys, especially to talk about such an, an amazing book that I enjoyed so much. Um, but it's one took over 14 hours uh, to record. So uh, one of the questions I get a lot is uh, like how long it actually takes to do that. So what, how much time Scott went into uh, recording this particular book right here, 14 hours uh, when someone gets it on, uh, on audible or wherever they may be listening to it. Um, how much time went into actually recording? How many times you click in that button? Is that a 30 hour thing or a 20 hour thing? Or uh, is it probably well, varies by book or what is, what, what is that like? I think I can't speak for Ray, but uh, there is uh, within the industry, it's generally a, a two to one ratio. It will take you two hours to record one. Um, just to edit out all of the, you know, the clicks, the pops, the whistles, the, the screw ups when we say, you know, talking about a, uh, um, a killing spree that took out 20 innocent bystanders. And instead you say it was a shopping spree that took out <laughs> bystanders. It happens. I bet. Yeah, I've been <laughs> on those. Um, but, uh, uh, so anytime, look, if you've got a book that's 30 hours long, you can imagine uh, the, the 60 studio hours went into that. Um, but I will say that uh, I took several days longer on this one 
just because I knew how personal what well, well look it's personal for Landon of course you know he wrote it but it's personal for me as well mm-hmm. uh, this is uh it's a peek behind the curtain yeah it's it's the uh it's the guy on that train mm-hmm. you know not whacking the script out of uh uh, uh uh, Richardson's Ralph hand. Richardson, yeah. Ralph Richardson's hand. It's uh, it's you know, it's it's getting to see how everything is done, and I knew how important it was for Landon that we get all the details right. Which is mm-hmm. why, at one point, at the very end, at the very beginning, I had that tally clicker, and I had edited all of them out. Um, and yet, I went to Landon. I emailed him, and I said. I have the feeling that if you just say the word tally clicker, people won't know what the hell we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Maybe I leave one in. And so we did that at the beginning of the book. And I just, I lifted it really close to the microphone and, you know, okay, that illustrates it. At the end of the book, you know, uh, not to give anything away, but there's a very personal project that comes along and uh, Sean is getting ready for it. And it suddenly occurred to me, oh, we could do it like bookends. Um, and so I, me as as <laughs> as myself, I'm going through my ritual of you know putting on the chapstick. <laughs> but but listen to the way that sounds. Listen to the way I sound right now, and then listen to the way I sound when I'm doing this. I'm not moving my lips because I'm I'm spreading this on there. Mm. Or you know, then I I go to drink the water, mm-hmm. and I said, well, why not? You know, after I take the you know, say that line into the bottle so that you could hear the little bit of echo. Mm-hmm. And then you hear. Just the, yeah. you know, swishing yeah. of, of the liquid. I was like, that's awesome. Maybe we can, gr- maybe we can ground them in a way like that again at the mm-hmm. end, the way that we did at the beginning, I ran it by Landon. He was cool with it. Um, I needed to make sure he knew about it so that when he's listening, good, what the hell is going on with his mouth? Why is he making all this noise? You know? yeah. um, but uh, uh, that's why I took longer that's... on that book. Um, what would ordinarily take me, uh, you know, a 28 hour work mm-hmm. week, uh, you know, 28 hours in the booth. Mm-hmm. There was a lot more just because I was trying to get it right. Yeah, that makes sense. And Ray, is the same for you? Is it a double? Yeah, <clears throat> it's about two to one. Um, it's, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty well, accurate really. Well, well, you're about to get, uh, only the dead here shortly and it's, uh, it's the longest so far. And I, you know, I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so get ready, but, uh, and I didn't start I'm out that way. In. You know, it's, uh, it, I started out thinking, you know, hundred, you want to get uh, these books about 110, 115,000 words is a good solid book there. And it just kept going. Cause you don't know as these characters develop and the story continues right. and all that. So it ended up being, uh, I think 137,000, well, I think. So I've also there. found that, you know, I mean, obviously the two to one thing is, is pretty pretty standard really but also there's another aspect of it which i think scott would would agree to the book takes as long as the book takes yeah same thing with writing there is there is no there is no like you know hard and fast like formula uh of like oh i'll have it done exactly on this day there are some books that take a heck of a lot longer um even though it may be the same word count might be the same number of pages as another book this book takes longer. This book doesn't, you know, it's interesting. It's very strange that way. Yep. It takes however long it takes. It's not like you get to 105,000 words as an author and you're like, well, I got to wrap this up. Like I don't, if the story takes how, well, how long you'll it's get, you'll take. get publishers saying, Hey, we have this book for you. We estimate it's going to be about 12 hours. And I'm always like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. To, it's good to estimate things. Yeah. Yeah. No, I got it. Hey everyone. Jack Carr here. I'm excited to tell you about a new Ironclad original series I'm executive producing. It's called Change Agents, and it's hosted by Andy Stumpf. On each episode, Andy tackles a different global issue, from sex trafficking and slave labor to homelessness and gang violence. And he interviews a guest who is risking it all to make a difference. The show offers an unfiltered look at the problems facing our world and explains how real agents of change are finding solutions. First episode drops on Ironclad's YouTube channel on March 27th and hits podcast platforms on March 28th. Change Agents and Ironclad Original coming soon. Follow at This Is Ironclad on YouTube and all social platforms for the latest. Got it, Red. 
that you had also narrated one of my favorite books of all time, uh, Atlas Shrugged. So, Ayn Rand. Oh, so for those there. watching, you can see just visually yeah. how long this book is. And if you open it, it's like the, the words are not large. Uh, the character, no, the, this font, font yeah, this <laughs> takes a while. Um, but it's, uh, you know, my top five people always ask me, what are your top five books of all time? And, um, Atlas Shrugged, Fountainhead, Winds of War, War and Remembrance. Um, like those are, they're long. Those are all once an Eagle and that mm -hmm. same thing. They're all, when I look at them on my shelf, they're all about the same length, but how long did this take you to do? Uh, yeah, boy, that's a, that's a story in and of itself. Um, <laughs> For many years, I want to say for about a decade, that was Audible's longest book, uh, uh, fiction yeah. uh, book, you know, other than like, uh, you know, Bugliosi's, uh JFK mm. ridiculousness and and uh, um, uh, uh, or uh, 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 the Bible, you know, Bible. Yeah. Um, Atlas Shrugged was uh, 63 hours. Well, I think it's a bet from back in the day. Anyway, it is the uh, best-selling book other than the Bible worldwide. I don't know if that yeah. still holds true or not, but it, it, yeah. it, at one point, absolutely. It was. The interesting thing about that is, okay, sixty-three hours. That would have taken me one hundred and twenty-six minimum hours in the booth. But I also uh, spent a lot of extra time on that one um, for a couple of reasons. My particular copy of Atlas Shrugged, Jack, I'll have to take a picture of it and send it to you. Uh, I've got all these yellow post-it notes along the uh, mm -hmm. um, the exterior right-hand edge um, just because whenever a I, I didn't know how to use the program yet. Pro Tools is the mm -hmm. the uh, digital audio writing program that I use. And uh, um, I didn't know how to put <laughs> I didn't know how to put in a marker so that if I use a character voice for for one person, uh, I could go back and listen to it. Yeah. I can just click a button and go back and listen to it. I didn't know how to do that yet. It was at the very beginning of my my experience okay. recording myself. And so I put post-it notes with like the session, the session number, the the uh, the timestamp. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, the time I wasted going back. Because look, there's a character introduced in the first page of that book that winds up coming back about 800 pages in. And I just knew that was going to happen. So... Uh, I, I, I've left all of those yellow post-it notes and oh, they're all fantastic. curled yeah. upward because I stick it onto my bookshelf. And it, you know, uh -huh. the I have the same back. thing. I have the same thing upstairs <laughs> in the office. Yeah. Yellow stickies like that in multiple it's like books. A, to me, it's like an artifact, yep. you know, exactly. uh, whenever I pull that book off the shelf. Uh, but the other reason it took so long <laughs> was the reason that we re-recorded that book oh, it you, was for blackstone audio who did it originally like was it uh, yeah they did it originally like someone on, on, on tapes probably in like the 80s maybe yep. back in back on uh it was a, it was recorded on reel to reel and then i believe that was how it was edited and then it was uh, duplicated onto cassettes and then okay. later cds but the problem is what they didn't know at the time with tape was there's bleed through on tape, you use one side of the tape and the other side. Mm. So you're recording on both sides of it. And there's bleed through. And it got to the point where the original masters had degraded so that there was so much bleed through, it sounded like somebody was talking in the other room. Oh, wow. Even though it was still the narrator's voice. Who was so it originally? Was, uh, I'm sorry? Who was it originally? I got to be honest, I don't remember. It's yeah. been about 15 years and I don't recall. Um, but what I remember is that I knew, uh, yeah, the book is broken down into three parts and I knew how long this project was going to take. Um, I got done with part one, 19 hours. The average audiobook is 11 hours. And this is part one and it's 19. Wow. So I sent it off to our friend Grover Gardner at uh, Blackstone. Cool. And I said, hey, in case you <clears throat> want to get started on editing this, you know, here's the first third. About three hours later, I get a really panicked phone call. How far have you gotten? I'm like, what? He goes, how much have you recorded? I mean, beyond like the 19 hours. I'm like, I haven't. I, I got done with the 19 hours of part one and I sent it to you. He goes, okay, hit pause. Don't don't record anymore. Like, what? He goes, there might be an issue with your microphone. Oh, no. And what it was, I was using a Sennheiser 416, which is the microphone I always used at Random House. Um, right, exactly. Shotgun mic. It's a, it's a great mic. 
And when I was in Random House's great big studios for many years, I would use that. And it, and it was perfect. People told me it was perfect for my voice. However, I'm recording this at home in a, in a, in a, in a booth that's barely bigger than a closet. And that's where you realize that no matter how much soundproofing, you know, the sound, the size, the shape of the booth <clears throat> matters just as much as the microphone. I had just started at Blackstone and was recording at those studios and taking a break with Andrew, the engineer, and Grover and listening to them talk about Scott Brick <laughs> and the problem with his Sennheiser 416. No and way. I didn't know you yet at that right. point. Right, right. <clears throat> well, it's it's funny. I I uh, <laughs> they get in touch and they said, Jeez. "Yeah, sorry, really bad news. We need you to start over." Oh, <laughs> oh my! Those gosh. nineteen hours took me two weeks to record, oh. and I was like, "Oh, you've got to be kidding me!" And they said, "We're going to pay you for the nineteen hours, and we will buy you a new microphone that I think will work better for your booth." And thank God they knew what they were talking about because I'm a total luddite. And wow. And, uh, I am not an audiophile at all. Uh, I had to rely on the experts, and they actually sent somebody over. They sent over Bob DeYoung. Um, uh, I know Ray will remember Bob. Yes. Uh, uh, Bob came over, uh, took my booth for a spin, got it all tricked out, put in the new microphone. I've been using it ever since. Which it, mic is it? It's a Rode K2. Great mic. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a tube mic. It has a really warm yeah. sound. And... Um, so people oh, ask me, they're like, well, you know, how long did that take you? Yeah, it took me two months. <laughs> oh, <laughs> because were you... because you know, it, was, it wasn't a 63-hour book. It was an 82-hour book. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And for all books for it to happen in, in a part one, it happens to ha go, be with Atlas right. Drugged. Exactly. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That is wild. Did you uh, notice or did you have to take some deep breaths to not record angry the next time around? Because, you know, when you write a letter and it's like a great email and then you, then you send it and then it go and they're like, it disappeared. What happened? I have no idea. And you got to start over and you're just writing angry. That happens to me sometimes. Um, you know, but I, in the yeah. books, that's why I'm saving Don't constantly. It's like saving angry. to cloud. It's saving everywhere uh, as I'm typing the, the novels now. But uh, did you record angry on that second one or did you have enough time to control yourself? Or are you just like, hey, it's all right. Let's do this no, again. As, They're paying as you're me. asking this question, I'm reminded of Bill Murray with the groundhog in his, That's in his right. lap. He's driving and he goes, <laughs> don't drive angry. Yep, don't drive angry. Is. I'm yep. like, don't record angry. Mm -hmm. don't yeah. record. It's true. You know, you, mm -hmm. you're doing a pickup and you're trying to match what you did. And you're like, damn it. You know, where you're supposed yeah. to sound like, and he went into the forest and looked for her. And he went into the forest. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not going to sound right. But oh, um, but uh, I did not. Yeah. Um, I, You know what I did, uh, to be honest? I reminded myself that I was getting paid. There you go. I did myself that I was getting paid for 19 hours that were never going to be used. And I thought Ayn Rand would be rather proud of me. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Did someone else do uh, re-record the Fountainhead? Or was that uh, what happened with that one? I'm not sure. Uh, not sure. Uh, who knows? You know, maybe the original recording of that one, you know, never degraded uh, yeah. uh, the way this one did. I've had to do that with a couple of books. I did that with a number of the early Clancy books. Oh, really? Patri yeah, Patriot Games. The same thing had happened to the masters of those. And when it came time to digitize them, to put them up on Audible, mm -hmm. it was bleed through. So they I asked me to read them. Oh, I recorded the uh, screenplay of Fountainhead. Oh, wow. Mm. For uh, Zack Snyder. Yeah. No. Kidding. How do he that... likes he likes to hear things rather than than read. He likes to hear it spoken. So he oh, I love that. He, he sent me that screenplay, and I did. What's well, how I got Dark Side? Wow. Yeah. He found out I narrate audiobooks. He brought me in to read Justice League rewrites and all of that other stuff. And <clears throat> we're in the Warner Brothers Leavesden Studios in the hallway in the office there, and he showed me a. CGI thing like what do you think this guy would sound like and I just looked at it and went ah, and I did this voice he's like cool two weeks later somebody else tells me you're playing this role but he wow. likes he likes hearing it rather than reading so wow. I I yeah somewhere hidden somewhere there's a recording of the screenplay the original one oh that is really cool wow. people are God, interested in that sort you of done thing something like that for Coppola uh yes uh, oh but... Coppola yes let's talk about that <laughs> oh i didn't bring this up ray 
<laughs> this was not me. No, uh, no, no. Let's talk about that. So, okay. You said in passing months ago. This is, this is foundational to my friendship with Scott. Mm, okay. Let's hear it. Please tell the story. Or shall I? So, um, I'll, tell, I'll tell the first part. Okay. Get it started. I get a call from my agent. Dude, get yourself together and go down to Paramount. Coppola wants to meet you. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so I go down there and uh, I, I meet Mr. Coppola. I meet his assistant, his longtime like sidekick, basically. Mm. And we talked forever. And it turned out that they were reading uh his new screenplay they wanted an audiobook narrator to do the interstitial you know fade in all of that other stuff you're familiar with that now jack yeah and um and i talked to him about it and it turned out the guy was really an audiobook aficionado i mean he he loves audiobooks you know and Fred Roos, about different things and yeah yeah and uh we had a great long talk and he was like so you'd be available to do this on this day i'm like yep three or four times uh, through the course of our meeting, he's like, you're available, right? And I was like, absolutely, totally. Okay, cool. Get to the end of it. And he goes, well, uh, this has been great meeting you. And uh, we're going to we're gonna go with Scott Brick. <laughs> and I went, <laughs> and then I honestly said, that's the best choice you can make. He's fantastic. Aww. Have a great time. Aww. And left. And I was like, yeah, Scott Brick, of course. Perfect. <laughs> Then I'm in New York <laughs> and I don't know Scott well at this point. And he's like, Hey man, I saw your picture, uh, in Coppola's office. And I think I was like, yeah, I just <laughs> sort of left. No, the, but the crazy thing is, so I go in to do the gig and there's, you know, Philip Seymour Hoffman. This is a week before he died. Oh. Right. Uh, it's 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 uh, 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 Joseph Gordon Levitt is there. Liev Schreiber and and uh, so many celebrities. Uma Thurman, you know, and and everybody, all these celebrities show up and we're all sitting around a conference table and they're essentially ostensibly auditioning for the film. Right. Wow. And uh, anyway, we go and we take a we take a, a lunch break and I go out into the lobby and there's wood paneled walls and there's one photograph, a, a, a headshot like that you would have, you know, headshot and resume. So it's an actor's headshot, one of them stapled to the wall and it's Ray. And I think I had met him one time at this point. We didn't know each other well at all. Yeah, no, not at all. And I was like, oh my God, that's awesome. Well, look, this is Coppola's office. Maybe he's up for something. I had no idea that he had come in and, and read for this. Oh my God, that's so, wild. And, and so I, you know, all I can think about is like, well, either he's up for something or maybe the, the assistant's kind of crushing on him. I mean, who knows? <laughs> that is a nice headshot. Both, I mean, both options, both viable, I know the one. viable options. Wow. And uh, anyway, he, uh, uh, when I said, hey, man, I saw your picture in Coppola's <laughs> office. I, you know, I hope that turned out well for you. Oh. And he's like, yeah, he didn't say it out loud, but he's like, what a dick. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that is crazy. Six months later, I uh, I see him again where at Random House, uh, Penguin Random yes. House at this point. And, and I mentioned something like, did you ever hear back? Right. And he looks at me and he goes, you don't know, do you? I'm like... <laughs> know what and um I, he tells me the story and i went oh my god you thought i was being an asshole <laughs> i really oh. wasn't i was genuinely rooting for you oh but, uh, my god but i've always we've always remembered this story and you're oh go and, and mileage I'm, so much uh, mileage, out of, mileage out of the story years oh go by gosh. and i'm at comic-con and i run into jonathan mayberry who is one of the most prolific authors out there, but uh, a relationship that, you know, Ray has had for many, many years. He's been narrating his Joe Ledger series and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And, and uh, 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 Jonathan had reached out to me in the early days of Facebook because he listens so often and, and we became friends, but virtually virtual friends. And we had never met in person. And he goes, Hey, can we take a picture? I said, sure. Hmm. So that's on your phone, right? 
by any chance, do you have Ray Porter's phone number in your contacts list? He says, yeah. I said, could you do me a favor and text this photo to him? <laughs> And I and I and I te- I told him because I, I dictated what I should say what it should say. He he texts me and says uh, he copies me on it and says, "Hey Ray, comma, I just ran into Francis Ford Coppola. Period. We need to talk." Oh. And, and at that point, I get a I get a text from Ray like five minutes later saying, "You're a dick." <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. He didn't get he didn't get the benefit of of hearing what I actually said when I first uh-huh. saw the photo, which I think would have made a master chief proud. Nice, nice. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh my gosh, that is so wild. Do you guys know if it's do, do other directors, producers do that sort of thing? Have have narrators I, come in and read the the fade in, fade out as they're doing a read through? I don't um, know, but they're missing a directors. trick if they don't. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like a great idea. I'd not heard of that. Oh before. yeah, film directors do that all the time. Interesting. And, and uh, yeah, they, as uh, Fred Roos was the producer, was Coppola's producer. He was one yeah. of the producers on The Godfather and Apocalypse Now and all the great films that Coppola did. And he said, "Look, it's the, it's the most boring part of the script, and mm-hmm. and we want to make sure everybody is engaged. So yeah. let's hire a book guy." Oh, I think it's fantastic. I'm going to recommend it for the uh, the seasons that we're working on right now. I think that's a great way to go. Gosh, I'll have, oh, to, really? look, I'll have to, uh, to look around and see if I can find any good narrators, though, to reach out to. Yeah, so, I don't know. So, <laughs> you guys, you ask, guys know anybody, Coppola. text me. <laughs> I'll ask, I'll ask, <laughs> maybe Coppola can recommend somebody. Yeah, yeah. maybe Coppola can recommend uh, you one. Well, we do drink a lot of his wine around here. Um, well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. actually, going to that winery better. is pretty cool. They have the memorabilia and stuff up there. I haven't been there in probably... 20 years mm. but uh yeah. they have like the surfboard from apocalypse now if i remember correctly and uh, a bunch of bunch of other oh yeah stuff he's got there. his oscars he's got his Oscars. are they there yeah. it's been a long time since i was yeah. up there but uh but yeah very I'm cool oh, man ray what's the longest one you've done Ooh, um i think i did a 30 at one point i haven't i haven't broken 50 hours um all right now i have a goal continuous, now I have a goal. continuous but yeah thank you uh continuous books um you know, a single book, I haven't broken 50. I mean, I've done series where they've given me the entire series at the outset and you just go through and that's, you know, a horrific number, (laughs) but, um, but I've not done, uh, maybe 40. I I know I haven't broken a 50 hour audio book. Okay. Got it. Oh, um, that is wild. And uh, Landon, when I opened this book up, I was very uh, excited to read that Carmel was featured prominently in there. Um, I spent a little time there over the years. I went to DLI defense language Institute, um, in the military. They wanted me to learn French. Uh, they thought I was going to go to North Africa, West Africa for some things. And I actually did end up going, but I had an interpreter the whole time. So all my French went out the window essentially, but, um, such a beautiful spot. I just love Carmel so much. Great memories there. Um, and so how did that, uh, that come into play being your other books are, are, are set in Michigan? Um, how did, how did all this come about? So, you know, the house, I don't know if you remember from Play Misty for me, but it's right there on the cliff. Right. And I, I don't know, that vision was in mind because that work was somewhere in the inner workings of the inspiration for some of the some of the book. And my aunt and uncle used to live out uh, in California. They lived in San Francisco and Carmel by the Sea. And I want to say it was even around the time when um, Clint uh, Eastwood was the mayor, if I'm I'm not mistaken. And so I had never really forgotten about that. And I thought, well, what is sort of the opposite of New York City, where the character Sean Frost, he starts out as you know, a playwright and an actor, um, someplace to travel cross country to reinvent himself. And I didn't want to put it in LA because for obvious reasons that you know of in the plot, that, you know, scenes happen there for a certain reason. Yeah. But I wanted to have it kind of in a peaceful, tranquil place away from everything where he can kind of concentrate on his work and become a, a better audiobook narrator, kind of have a sanctuary there, which in- isolates him from, you know, some of his other demons as well. So it's probably, you know, my experience of my aunt and uncle being out there. Uh, and then previous works that it was just appealing. I I saw it, you know, as a film. I I would love to 
you know, see that portrayed uh, if and when uh, this ever uh, makes it to the to the to the theater. Yeah, no, it's such a beautiful spot. It's so peaceful and tranquil. It's perfect, perfect spot. Um, it, yeah, absolutely love love Carmel. And then, how about first person? Uh, when I open a book and I'm not, I don't know ahead of time that it's going to be first person. Um, I'm always yeah. like, oh, like for a second, I get the I get a shock for whatever reason. I don't know why. Probably because most things I read are not. Um, yeah. But and then and then it's just oh, it was amazing. I, I mean, I love that that you did that. Uh, and then listening to Scott read it, it was a fantastic. Um, but uh, how how was how did the first person uh, come about. So all my other books are either third person omniscient or third person close. But I thought for this one, it had to have a sense of intimacy. And in order to have some of the twists that I had planned, I thought the only way that you can do that is if you're inside the head of the main character for almost the entire, um, book. And so I thought first person would allow reliable, unreliable narration to play in. Um, And then also too, when you can switch to first person from another character, you get their viewpoint on the same scene and what they're going through. And then like when we've seen, you know, the movie, the game in the mid Mm nineties, or you see a beautiful mind when you're limited to a certain point of view, um, you don't realize what's going on until you see someone else's point of view. And that was really fun to play with. Mm-hmm. And in terms of present tense, that was something also that I've never done and haven't done since. I've done two books since then. Um, but I felt that I wanted the reader to feel that this is happening to Sean right now. Mm-hmm. And we've got to pay attention to, to what happens next. And I had always wanted to collaborate and do a project like this with Scott because he can get inside the head of someone so well and other works that uh, that I've heard, especially there's one that he did, The City of Mirrors with Justin Cronin, where there's a character that he made an artistic decision to go really close to the microphone and have this whisper that you're and just enamored with it. And so I said, this would be kind of neat to hear him play Sean Frost and, and see what he could do. So that... I don't think I could have had the twist if it wasn't first person, because you'd have that level of objectivity that, you know, you you can't lie to your reader from your that kind of narration. Yeah, no, it really works. It really works in here. And uh, for you guys, you guys ever had a, uh, uh, a crazy stalker? I guess they're not another kind. I don't need to say crazy yeah. in front of stalker. Um, <laughs> but uh, do you have anybody that reaches out? To you and is a little maybe too aggressive wanting you to narrate something or that's just I've, a little I've, off or yeah, now, especially since dark side like what i mean well that's a whole other floor of the building but yeah <laughs> um yeah i've had some interesting encounters in fact uh, uh I, at one point i think i came to you jack for some advice yep yep uh because i had i had liked a certain movie that was yeah. about a certain figure who's highly political and i thought the movie was really good and I said it was a masterpiece and I got threats of physical violence oh, geez, so crazy. Um, from people. So it was <laughs> fun. I, I would say so now Ray's front yard is lined in Claymore mines. If anybody's ex- thinking oh, about yeah, it, so absolutely. just clack those things yeah. off. If anybody yes, approaches. Exactly. I, I wear a t-shirt that's on the gardeners. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. My t-shirt says front towards There's, enemy. Yeah, it is. Um, but um Conversely, mm-hmm. I've also had some amazing experiences yeah. uh, with that. I was signing, I was signing Dark Side autographs in Colorado Springs, and a guy came over with two copies of Project Hail Mary, which is a book that I had narrated, and uh, wanted me to autograph one for him and one for his friend. And I said, "Your friend isn't here right now." And he said, "No, nah, he's he's downrange. He's in Afghanistan cleaning things up." Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, but, "But when I was there with him." he and I would sit and listen to the book while we were over there and just, you know, it helped stuff. And that got me very weepy, you know, um, that was pretty intense, but yeah, you know, you get, you get, you, you learn to kind of arm's length things early on. I created a completely separate, uh, Facebook page from my personal page because (laughs) wow. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, you just, you just get good at healthy boundaries. Yeah. Yeah, it was probably I, easier to do like 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Now sure. people are so reachable just because of the nature of uh, true. these. But if you do a little bit of work, expect. you can set up you can set up barriers. You can yeah. set up velvet ropes. Yeah, you there know. you go. There you go. It's uh, gratefully, I've I've uh, uh, not had 
anything uh, uh, quite like that. Uh, yeah. I have had, uh, um, you know, you, you run into a, 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 a lot of dicks online, you yeah. know. Uh, I had one guy, I, 10 years ago, I found out I had uh, thyroid cancer, which was oh. thankfully, you know, non-aggressive. Um, uh, oh yeah. And this guy went on my website and like all capital letters. Oh, thank God. Scott Brick will, you know, die and stop ruining good books. Um, oh, you know, crazy. so, you know, you deal with that every now and again, but, uh, fortunately most of the time, even that time I was able to laugh it off. Uh, one time I was at a library in Texas, I was in Midland, Texas. <laughs> and um they had forgotten they had flown me out to do this event and they had forgotten to do any kind of pr for it so nobody showed up there was like seven people in the audience and and there were these two little old ladies and so this room would fit 300 people and there's three or four people in the back yeah. and then there's these two grandmothers in the front row sitting right next to one another and they're right in front of my podium and uh, uh, one of them says, I'm like, hey, are there any questions from the audience? And this woman, one of the grandmothers couldn't bring herself to address me directly. But she said it loud enough for the entire room to hear. But she addressed it to her friend. And she says, could you ask him if he ever gets excited by any of them sex scenes he reads? Oh. And if so... Does he ever read them in the all together? Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> well, naked recording. There yeah. you go. Naked recording. We've come full we've come circle. circle. We've come full circle. Uh -huh. One oh, thing that my. I do think, the thing I was, I I was think... blushing so hard, I thought my face was going to explode. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Landon's, Landon's book touches on something, though, that is a hundred percent accurate and it was a shock to me having dealt with audiences of various types tv and theater and all of that other stuff i have never ever known an audience to have such a sense of ownership like audiobook listeners mm. they lit i mean yeah. laser-like critiques um they are impassioned about it mm -hmm. you know if they don't like something they're equally impassioned and they have a really strong sense you know in a way that i don't think is true of other audiences necessarily but man listeners go on audible and look at reviews of books these people take it seriously yes yes it's uh, and, and today you can reach out let's say 1985 if you were listening to one of these one of these books on cassette and uh someone said uh like pow instead of p o w for prisoners of war or something like that oh yeah like who are you going to tell you can tell your your wife your spouse um and then who else the neighbor Maybe, yeah. I don't know, somebody at work who's not going to pay any attention to you. But now, oh boy, you can tell, well, you can just sit there for the hours burdens. letting that's everyone know. That's one of know. the you bring with you into the booth of mm. like, you know, I need to do this 100% because there will be somebody from there mm -hmm. yeah. who will reach out to me on Facebook and yeah. say, you said this wrong. Guaranteed. Yeah. Yeah. It, I've, yeah. I've had a lot of uh, writers over the years. Uh, when I would come to the word obituary, okay, fine. You you accent the uh, you put the accent the stress on the second syllable. So when you came to the word uh, you know obit, uh, it was like oh okay, it's an obit mm -hmm. because that's the way it is in obituary. But in um, in the newspaper game, it's an obit. It's yep. the first mm -hmm. syllable. Interesting. And 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 I totally get it. And I, I remember I had a guy come to me um, at. Um, the original books on tape studio in uh, uh well nobody's gonna nobody in the audience is gonna remember where this was but we were out in woodland hills um just outside of la mm -hmm. uh and a guy came up to me and he said i don't know how to pronounce this word and we're looking it up online and we can't figure out how to do it and I said, okay, well, what's the context? And he said, okay, it takes place in like Chicago gangland, you know, like Al Capone days in the early 1930s, uh, early to late 1930s. And um, uh, and it says, get somebody on the, and then he shows me the word and it's capitalized, A-M-E-C-E. -E. The, the A is capitalized. He says, Amis, Amici, Am Amich. And I said, it's Amici. And he's like, how do you know that? And I said, Don Amici played Alexander Graham Bell in a film in the 1930s. And it became a slang thing, get somebody on the Amici for me. No kidding. 
wow. called the phone the Amici. No way. Well, you know what? There may be one person in the audience who understood that reference, yeah. but for that one person, we it's got vitally important. Yeah. And, and and narrators, whenever they get together or or online or whatever, and you know, in various groups, there will be. Yesterday, I saw somebody. Anybody know a native Icelandic speaker? Mm. <laughs> I, I have to pronounce this thing. Anybody know? You know, um, it's yeah. We try to be resources for each other, and the one great thing about being a shut-in audiobook narrator is guaranteed. One of us will have that arcane knowledge. We'll know that weird little factoid. Mm. Uh, one, one of the things, Jack, that I saw in researching was it's sort of akin to a reader and an author, the relationship that they have, even though, you know, 99% of the time you never meet, but there's nothing as personal as this came from one person, an author's brain went to the page and goes into a reader's brain. You know, there's no filter, there's no, you know, director or, you know, something on film. And I think of it's, and you think of when you're reading a book by someone that you really love an author and we all have them, you feel like you're catching up with an old friend. And I found that with narrators, it's the same thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Listeners have this very personal relationship, almost kind of like cult-like followings where, they will say, I don't care what the book is, as long as Ray Porter or Scott Brick yep. is narrating it. I'm just going to listen because I'm catching up with my friend. Uh, they're telling me about World War II here. And, mm -hmm. oh, here's a narrator getting kidnapped here. <laughs> you yeah. know, and th the thing with that is when the subject and I, I leverage that, of course, for the first part of the book, I, I, it helped me develop that scenario. But I. I had some readers emailing me and <laughs> serious. They're like, is Landon, is Scott okay? Is he all right? <laughs> right. I, yeah, I can I, see that. I just wrote like, Scott's fine. Ellipses. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, perfect. And then I think Ray was over there, Scott, you know, the story better than I do, but it was another friend that was at your place for the Indy 500 that looked at you <laughs> and got very, very serious about what they thought would happen to you. <laughs> Oh my yeah, gosh. Um, uh, my, uh, uh, watching the Indy 500 is a, a, an emotional experience for me. My father and I used to watch it every oh. year. And this was the first year, this past year was the first year on Memorial Day where um, uh, my father wasn't going to be here. And Ray knew about that as well as my friend Josh Christian. And um, they both reached out and said, can we spend the day with you? We would like to spend this day with you so you're not alone watching the Indy 500. It was lovely. And I had uh, uh, Jack, that, that exact same copy of that book. And it was sitting on, on the, uh, uh, the arm of, uh, one of the chairs in the, in the living room. And Josh says, do you mind if I glance through this? I said, no, great. I had already gone through it to look for notes that I would want to share with Landon and, you know, yeah. just this way. And, and he's, he's kind of, you know, he's paying attention to the race, but he's, you know, he's got his nose buried in the book. And and the race gets done, and he says, "Do you mind if I take this with me?" I said, "Sure." He goes, "Yeah, it's really compelling. I really want to find out what happens." But you know, right? I'm like, "I know." He goes, "I mean, you know." I'm like, "What do I know?" He goes, "This is how you're gonna die." Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, I was like, uh, "Okay." He goes, "No, no, it's a blueprint." Oh. <laughs> oh goodness! Like, yeah, thanks. Good to see you too, pal. <laughs> oh my gosh! Great. Uh, well, people might not know that uh, audiobooks are the fastest growing segment of publishing. Um, I think that uh, podcast listeners naturally gravitate towards audiobooks because they're already mm -hmm. listening, and and uh, it's just a natural thing for them to do. So uh, it's it, it and you. And just like Landon said, you have a fan base that follows you from project to project, which is something that I didn't know um, uh, at the outset of this because uh, I'm primarily a reader and I, did, I didn't know that. So I got extremely fortunate that uh, that Ray said yes uh, to narrating my my audiobook. So I had a I'm whole a fan base one, that oh, I, I don't know about that, but it's uh, it, their fan base came came with you. Um, and, and that that part is, is just incredible. So people have this relationship with you that, you know, you'll never know them personally for the most part, but it's such a personal connection. Um, but uh, I did want to ask you, Landon, about this, about uh, David Killian. Um, and I, cause I love the, 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 the agent and publisher and, and all that sort of thing. Cause it, it, I don't see that side of it. I just know my agent. I don't have any other experience with other agents. Um, 
my my um, uh, my vision of what an agent was all came from Hollywood. So it was, uh, you know, all from from TV and film, and they're always wheeling and dealing and all this stuff. Or you think that they're going to give you a lot of advice and like take your kind of guide your career and saying this is what you need to do next and all that. And that's not my relationship with my with my agent. She just does the contract stuff, and I like that because there's no politics involved. And neither does my editor. They never say, "Hey, do you mind uh, laying off a little on this, or doing a little more of this, or hey, you know what? I think would be good for your for your writing career would be to do this next." Zero. And I like that because then there's no one to blame but me. I can't say, "Oh, you know, I did what you said, and now it didn't work, or whatever." I like that's not even. That's not even a consideration. So if something doesn't work, it's all it's all on me, uh, not on my editor, publisher, not on my agent. And I like that relationship um, because I feel complete artistic freedom there. There's no no one guiding me and telling me what I should or shouldn't do or where I need to go next or what would be best for me or or whatever. There's zero of that, and I love it. Um, but I read sometimes the acknowledgments of other people's books, and there's you know they they say how much their their agent or their publisher guides them and how thankful they are and all that that sort of a thing. So it was really fun to read this character, David. And uh, so I was wondering where that where that came from, and especially the negotiation chapter, which I think is about right in the middle somewhere. Um, so reading that negotiation chapter was uh, was a lot of fun. And I'm sure it was fun to read, Scott. I don't know. It seemed like it anyway. Um, but uh, what, where did that character, character come from? And uh, that was just a really fun part for me anyway. Yeah. So, you know, my wife and I have our own business, Land and Beach Books LLC. So we're a mighty army of two. So I do not have a traditional agent. Um, I have secured um, film and TV rights representation, and you know, narrator right now is being read by multiple Hollywood studios and also um, streaming services. And so it's the same thing that you just said, Jack, which is I hand it off to him and he's out there being an advocate and talking about it. And I probably won't hear anything until there's news to share. But what I thought about for this is that there are some agents in the audiobook industry. And I thought it's very much the same as with an author. It would be a pretty boring book talking about our daily existence, which is in a room with no one writing, hacking away at the keyboard. That's not very dramatic. And as I've talked with Scott, too, you know, being in a booth, putting in the hard work that you've got, it's you know hard to make that dramatic. And so I took some of the knowledge that I did have of the industry because I've researched it for years. And some of the stuff that goes on um, is close to the mark. And then there's a lot of it, too, that I Hollywooded up just for the needs of the story to get. Oh, you, you know, got to Hollywood up an agent. Right. I mean, it just lends itself yeah. to that sort of a thing. I mean, it's just fun. Right. And I had no idea that as soon as the book came out, another narrator started reading it. Scott's phone was ringing like crazy. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, dude, do you make that much for doing an audio book? And so I'm like, you know, no, I mean, those, those things among other things are, are inflated, but um, in terms of working deals, um, yeah, some of the high profile agents um, work a couple big deals a year and they kind of live off that the, the rest of the time. Um, but yeah, it was fun to write that knowing mm -hmm. that, was Hollywooding some things up um, to give it a little bit more, uh, a more juice, but yeah. yeah, some stuff in there, it does take place all behind the scenes. And there's some other uh, authors that you mentioned and I'm like, does he mean so-and-so or so-and-so? Cause you changed some, some names. Uh -huh. There's some real names in there and there's some, you know, Steven Spielberg, obviously, <laughs> you know, but there's some other ones in there. You know. Speaking of real names, there's a moment at the, uh, there's a scene at the Audis yeah. <clears throat> where Sean is uh, uh, walking to his table. And at the audience, it's typically round tables, 10 people to a, to a table. And he says, at one point, I'm on my way to my table. I pass the table with uh, Scott Brick, uh, Suzanne Elise Freeman, who's my fiance, Ray Porter, Pat Fraley, <laughs> and Simon Vance. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm reading this aloud. I'm reading my name. <laughs> so great. Book, and I'm like, this is so freaking meta. This is so weird. And also, these are the most important people in my life. Literally, Pat Fraley just came by my door and dropped something off. Oh, that's He's fantastic. tapping on the glass, going, Sonny, answer the door. I'm like, <laughs> I'm in an interview. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm like, as I'm reading that 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 scene, I'm like, well, this is a weekend for me. Yeah. That's my social life. That's, so that's the table I would absolutely be sat at, too. It's so great. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I was, I'm still, you know, Kokomo, Indiana enough that when I read that thing, I was like, they put my name in the book. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Oh, it's so cool. Oh, no, I love, I love that. It was uh, all that was great. And I love the, the little '80s references. You got Dallas in there. Falcon Crest is in one of your other other books, so you throw that in there. I use the Dallas uh, Dream uh, reference quite a bit when we're talking about things for these next seasons. Uh, if something oh, pops up, you know, it, 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 and you and you know who's an '80s kid by uh, you know by who by the state by the looks you get uh, when you make that that reference. So I, I love all that that all stuff. Four of us are our Generation Xers. So we're a, we're a small, but a mighty cohort here. Yeah. Yep. No, I love that. Absolutely. And I, I weave some of that stuff into, into my novels as well. Some, uh, some things are more obvious than others. A lot of it probably no one gets, but, but me, but yeah. I, uh, yeah. but I weave that stuff and it's fun for me as I, as I go along, but, uh, but you have two books, you have two books coming out here, one in August and one later in the year. Is that, is that right, Landon? Did I read that somewhere? 20, 2023 has a couple more for you. Yeah. So right now, I'm working my way through a trilogy of murder mystery books. Mm -hmm. And what I thought um, would be interesting is that in that murder mystery book, it is an author who has writer's block, but she's one of the most successful um, authors ever. And she's trying to come up with ideas for her next book. And she ends up moonlighting as a private investigator. But I go into a lot of the backstory of what is this mythical character named Adrian Astra, who, you know, she loves, you know, sort of like you're with James Reese and you think about him all the time. You, you can't wait for their next adventure and you're trying to figure out what to do. And she has to wrap it up. And so what I thought was something that I don't think audiences had seen before is I said, what if I had a novel or novella? I'm working on it right now, so I'm not sure what the length will be, mm -hmm. but what if I had a novel or novella with that character, the fictional character, and showed the origin story of this assassin? And that was when <laughs> I sent you that you know, DM, and I thought I had done a lot of research about what an assassin, you know, the, the weapons, and like within two seconds, Jack came back with like eight questions. And I looked at my wife and I was like, right, right. Yep. I haven't thought of any of that. My <laughs> would be dead right now. <laughs> and so I'm going to do an origin story for the character within the book, within the book. Nice. And I thought that that might be neat for readers because when the third book in the trilogy comes out in December, it'll be... They'll, they'll know who this character is that, you know, this author has lived and died with for a decade or so, but also at the same time, her journey as an author is coming to an end, and I'm going to have those threads kind of come together. And then an opportunity came up from working with Scott. I thought that Susanna Lee's Freeman, his fiance, would be the perfect narrator for Adrian Astra. And so we've been in talks and uh, happy to say that uh, she's going to narrate that one oh, um, when that really? comes out. So it's going to be really sweet. So I'm, I'm excited to see this kind of all come together and end by Christmas time. That's amazing. I'm working on two books a year now. I have multiple projects in the works and it is, uh, especially with kids and everything else, it's it's chaos. Uh, it is constant chaos, but it's great. It's wonderful. Uh, so, so Ray, get ready. There's some things uh, in, in the works. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. Awesome. And speaking of that, what else do you have in the, the works, Ray? What do you got, have going on? Multiple um, books? Like they piling just, up? I know you have one like, coming. Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, blessedly, I've got a, I've got a pretty full docket right now. Um, finishing up a, a book from an author uh, that I really admire and, and I like, he's a friend, a guy named Scott Sigler. Um, I have just, I have just submitted a short story for Joe Ledger Unbreakable, which is uh, Jonathan Mayberry's collection of stories about the characters within his the world that he's created, but written by other authors. Huh. Uh, and it's going in. I'm getting, you know, like, hey, what's your address for royalties? And I'm getting oh, rewrites wow. and stuff. And so oh, I'm fantastic. Like, I know it's weird. It's like I, I'm writing. What? Um you know, and that's uh, basically planning modifications to the uh, LX470 and narrating nice. books. Nice. That takes a while. Like, I'm about to do, like, Dude. yeah, I'm about to go through a list here for the 80 series that's now two years old that I just haven't had time to sit down and go through yeah. everything that I want to put on there and then get it to the right people that know what they're doing, uh, get it to the experts so that things don't fall off as I'm driving down the road. <laughs> um, I, 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 much like getting my books, like people ask me all the time, like, why don't you read your own books? Well, I want it to go to the best people that it could possibly go to to do that, who that's their.
their thing. Um, the same thing with uh, getting it to to Chris Pratt and Antoine Fuqua for the for the series. Like I, I want to yeah. give this to the best people I possibly can um, to make it the best product I possibly can for that listener, for that viewer, for that reader. Um, yes. But uh, yeah, so I, I, point being, it's on my list this week because I'm kind of taking a not really a breath, but uh, getting to some things that have been piling up for the last couple of years and, uh, sure. and getting these, uh, the 80 series modifications first. And I ended up with the uh, Land Cruiser from the show, uh, from the Terminal list. I know you did, and yeah. I'm extremely jealous because <laughs> when I watched the show, I was like, oh, that is a sweet rig. Yeah, it looks so much like, I shouldn't say that. Well, I will. Much like a lot in Hollywood from the outside, it looks oh, fantastic. Yeah. It looks beautiful. Inside needs a little work. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, in fact, it's not even working right now. And that's, so I, that's so it showed up, me. You just <laughs> stop it. Me. Come on. That's not true. <laughs> uh, so when I got it, I t- we were on this kind of mountain hill thing. And, uh, so I, it showed up and I jumped in it and took it for a spin and almost yeah. flew right over the side, hit the brakes. Mm. Like yeah. Almost went over the side and I got it back and I texted Chris and, uh, or I called him and let him know that it showed up Chris Pratt. And he's like, oh, there were two, because there were three of them for the film, two that looked like the one you saw, and then yeah. one that was just like a normal uh, FJ62 Land Cruiser that had the cage around it. So when he's driving, there's the camera there, and it doesn't yes. need all the tires and rack and all the other stuff. Um, right. So he's like, oh, hey, be careful, because I don't know which one you got. And um, uh, one of those, the brakes aren't working so <laughs> really well. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, that's the one I got. And I that's the one says, you got. Yeah, I almost went over yeah. the side. So uh, <laughs> also on my list is getting that to somebody who can uh, keep the outside looking like it was in the show yes but maybe replace everything I've, else yes i've just been told i need a new radiator uh, that so happens. before yeah. i do any fun mods yeah i need to stick a new radiator in there because yeah. you gotta doesn't matter if it looks pretty if it leaves you stranded in exactly. the middle of the desert exactly and we can't have that we can't have people getting pictures of land cruisers on the side of the road no uh, they'll leave those to defenders and that just kidding defender people i love defenders also <laughs> uh, great to look at no just kidding i love them uh one will be in the driveway at some point but uh and scott what do you have going on you have a what is this book insight is that what's going on there oh oh boy yeah that's a novel i've been working on for a long time how long i got uh uh mumble mumble years it's um uh it's a um uh, a book about I read about a uh, a very bizarre um, uh, brain disorder. Um, uh, long story, but uh, basically, the person who is the witness to a murder has this left hemisphere brain disorder, um, uh, and the cops don't know whether or not they can trust. You know, his interpretation of events and it's how do you proceed? Uh, and of course, one of the cops investigating the crime, it was her husband who was murdered, also a detective on her on her force. And um, and she's desperate to believe this witness, but nobody else is inclined to. So um, it's basically um, I like it to me, the best kind of uh, murder mystery is where the murder is you know where the where the details of it are just incidental to the story it's mo- mostly about the relationship between two people same thing with science fiction you know i look at ender's game as a master of the genre because it's not about it's not about the the spaceships it's not about the alien race it's about parental relationships mm-hmm. sibling relationships and um um i was just so fascinated with this idea of can you trust what you're desperate to trust or do you need to be, you know, pull back a bit and be a bit more, uh, 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 doubtful. Wow. Um, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you carry on in those circumstances? So, wow, that sounds fantastic. So coming summer, 2023, is that what we can uh, announce? Yes. Okay. Well, your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> My agent is asking the exact same. Oh, really? <laughs> Can I can I narrate it, or are you getting Francis Ford Coppola to do that? <laughs> I'll probably hire some Brit to do it, like Simon. Oh, <laughs> oh man! Oh. Simon Vance or John Lee, or you know, whatever. Oh, Technically, God. it's a, it's a it's a book that should be narrated by a woman. The woman is the main character, and audiobooks are very. Do you generous. know it? Do you know any female narrators? <laughs> I answer carefully. I, you going back to what Landon was saying earlier when uh, he put in the book, he sends me the, uh, the copy of this uh, Huron Nights, and um, 
here on Breeze, pardon me. And I'm reading along, I'm prepping the book, and it says that this that this uh, uh, this author hires her audiobook narrator, Susanna Lee Freeman, to say one line at a press conference. And I said, look, I know it's only one line of the audiobook, but if you want me to actually get Susanna Lee Freeman, I'm pretty sure I could get her for you. Does she have her number? Yeah. <laughs> And so, so I call, I, I, I reached, I emailed Landon and I said, do you want me to do this? And we wound up having her record the, uh, 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 yeah. the credits, the in, the in and out credits too. So it's not really a surprise when you hear her voice for this one line, but yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. I do, I do know narrators. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh great oh man well thank you guys all for doing this um yeah this is so much fun for me and such an honor to have everybody on here and this book fantastic they should get the book and obviously get the audiobook which was up for uh the audible award this year um but fantastic right here and that's the cover i love the cover too by the way whoever made the this cover but it's uh so good. yeah it is it's fan it's great i love it the covers that tell the story like right there and you know, same thing with movie posters and, and that sort of thing. Uh, since we have eighties kids here, VHS box, you know, artwork, oh, yeah. um, that sort of a thing that tells the story, uh, on there. So, um, so congratulations to everybody and Ray, thank you for reading my novels and, and, uh, thank you guys for Always, writing and friend. for, uh, you know, doing this, uh, this book together here. And, and it's just, it's just great. I hope everybody goes out and reads it and has as much fun with it as I did. Thanks so much for uh, having us on, Jack, and obviously your service and everything that you continue to give back to the book community uh, and in the world. Oh, appreciate that. Appreciate that. Awesome, guys. Well, hopefully we can all meet up at the Audibles one of these years and put on the tuxes and have some drinks together. All right. Yeah. Great. Let's right. do it. Let's Good do it. Good to see you again. Great to see you, too. Great to see you, too. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Thank you. All right. Navy Federal Credit Union. Those dreaded finances, managing your money can be hard. They're competing goals, growing savings, paying debt, managing every day and unexpected expenses, plus a little having fun. Navy Federal Credit Union takes the legwork out of saving and investing with a variety of choices. Want to supersize your savings earnings? They're offering some of their highest rates in 10 years. And whether you choose savings or investments, you can make it easier by automating. Plus their website has articles, tips, and tools that make complicated subjects easier to understand. I've been a member since 1996, my first year in the Navy. For those watching, you can see my Navy Federal Credit Union cue card right there. And they have been awesome to me and my family over all these years. So check out Navy Federal's supercharged rates at navyfederal.org slash save and invest. Saving products insured by NCUA. Investment options are available through Navy Federal Investment Services and are not insured by NCUA. Check them out, navyfederal.org. Let's talk about Aimpoint. Proven, reliable, trusted. The original Red Dot since 1975. Originally developed for hunting purposes, their sights were adopted by the U.S. Army in 1997. I've been using them for over 20 years now. Absolutely love Aimpoint. If you go to my Instagram, Jack Carr USA, you can scroll down and see a few pictures of me running an Aimpoint in Afghanistan in the early days. What I want to talk about right now is the Acro P. Two, right here. Look at this thing. That is solid. So Aimpoint revolutionized red dot pistol optics with the Acro P1. Now the Acro P2 represents the next generation of pistol mounted optics. It features a brighter, more efficient LED emitter coupled with a higher capacity battery to provide over five years of constant on use. That's right, over five years. It's designed to withstand shock, vibration, and extreme temperatures. This thing is solid. Absolutely love it. I'm going to get a few of these things, and I love it so much. It is in my upcoming novel, Only the Dead. So I have big plans for this. Awesome. Also want to mention the Comp M5 M5S right here. So this thing is awesome. And what I really love about this is that it has a AAA battery. So you can find AAAs pretty much 
anywhere. So that is a huge advantage, in my opinion, on this right here. It features battle-proven Aimpoint Comp Series now in a lightweight compact model. It takes that AAA battery, and that resolves a lot of travel restriction issues, and it's compatible with Aimpoint 3 by and 6 by magnifiers, one of which I have right there, and all generations of night vision devices, and is compatible with multiple mounting solutions. Just awesome. Finally, the Comp M4 M4S. It features professional quality red dot optic for use under extremely harsh conditions. The U.S. Army has chosen a member of the Aimpoint Comp M4 series of sights as their M68 CCO close combat optic for over two decades. It's powered by a single AA battery for over 80,000 hours, eight years of continuous use, and over 500,000 hours in the night vision setting. It's compatible with Aimpoint 3x magnifiers and all generations of night vision. During the month of March, receive a free signed copy of The Devil's Hand in hardcover with your purchase of any Aimpoint Comp Series or Micro T2 Optic. Visit aimpoint.info slash jackcar and use code jackcar. J-A-C-K-C-A-R-R. Check them out. Today's episode is also brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee Company. Grab a can of Black Rifle Coffee's ready to drink the perfect balance of quality and convenience. If you want a Spartan-level caffeine kick, try Ready to Drink 300, available in salted caramel, vanilla balm, and more. Made with an electrifying blend of MCT oil and amino acids, Ready to Drink 300 packs a caffeine punch that'll supercharge your day. Ready to Drink is perfect if you need your coffee quick, and shopping with Black Rifle Coffee helps give back to the veterans and first responders who serve our nation. You can stock up on cans at blackriflecoffee.com or grab an ice cold can at a convenience store near you. You can stock up at blackriflecoffee.com slash dangerclose and use code dangerclose20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. BlackRifleCoffee.com slash Danger Close for 20% off. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast. All right, first off, thank you so much to Badass Workbench, badass-workbench.com. Check them out. They made this right here for me, and I absolutely love this desk. It is serious. It is solid, and uh, can't thank them enough. So very cool. Check them out, badass dash workbench and look at this for those there are people out there that are collecting all the versions of my novels in different languages so this is the japanese version right here and how cool is that look at that artwork love the cover of the international versions particularly this one i'm going to frame this one and uh very cool because i'd only seen the cover art on my computer and i didn't realize it was going to be this small but very cool so for those collecting those or for People who may be watching in Japan, there it is, right there. Very cool. And right here, Skipper's Custom Leather. Find them on Instagram, Skipper's Custom Leather. And look at that. Look at that belt. You see that right there? Cross Tomahawks on there. So thank you guys so much. This belt is solid. And thank you so much for all the other things that you've made for me to include this watch band right here on the Aries. And this thing, love it. So thank you so much. Once again, Skipper's Custom Leather on Instagram. All right, what's next? Park City Gun Club, right there. Thank you guys for taking care of me. I'll be down this week. And you know what? It doesn't matter when anyone is watching this because I'm always down there this week. So if you're passing through Park City, also stop by Park City Gun Club. They have some things you can rent there that are pretty cool uh, to include AKs and you can let loose on full auto with those. And it's a cool place to hang out. So stop by there and... Maybe, uh, maybe I'll be there too. You can say hi. So Park City Gun Club, thank you. And Black Rifle Coffee, big fan of this one too. Rambos, look at that. And there's an actual bow on there. Yep, look at that. That is awesome. Very cool. Check out the helicopter. Oh, yeah. For those who are kids of the 80s, 
There you go. BlackRifleCoffee.com. And if anybody watched my podcast with Mike Glover of Fieldcraft Survival, we spent a little time talking about socks. And uh, we started talking about darn tough socks. So I ordered a bunch after that podcast. And I'd, I'd had a bunch of darn toughs over the years, but uh, it was time to get a bunch more. So I went on there, got a bunch more, and love these ones right here. I ordered a bunch of different ones, but for right now, with the boots that I'm wearing in this kind of weather, these ones are nice. And they are the mid-weight with full cushion boot sock, and right there. A bunch of different colors on their website, and made in the USA. So check them out out there in Vermont, and darn tough socks. And a bunch of new stuff on the website, officialjackcar.com. Click on merch in the upper right-hand corner uh, to include mugs like this. A bunch of other stuff on there as well. Oh, coasters like that. Yep, all sorts of new stuff on there. So you can check that out. And Protect, my buddy Nick Norris, who has been on the podcast before, P-R-O-T-E. KT.com. And right here, this is the immunity and their liquid supplements. So just tear them open, put them into your Nalgene bottle or whatever else, uh, glass, stir it up. And uh, I've heard that people also just cut them like Nick talked about on the podcast and just drain them. But uh, I'd recommend putting them into some water, stirring it around and drinking them like that. And they're very good. So check those out. They have a hydration one, energy one, been using that one a lot lately. And this immunity one right here, but they've got a bunch of stuff. So protect.com, check them out. And whew, SIG, look at this thing right here. So this MPX, oh yeah, check this out. I've wanted one of these for quite some time. Check that out, nice. I'm probably gonna drop some, uh, some irons on there, front and rear, drop an aim point, maybe like that one right there. Um, we shall see, but get the red dot on there, get the backups on there, throw a sling on here and a light, and I cannot wait to give this a run. So thank you, SIG. Check out SIG and everything they have going on uh, at SIGSour.com. So thank you guys, appreciate that. And that is it for today. Take care out there. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My upcoming novel, Only the Dead, is available for pre-order right now and is narrated by Ray Porter. You can find Ray Porter on Instagram at the.ray.porter, and you can find him on Twitter at Ray underscore Porter. You can find more about Scott Brick on his website, scottbrick.com, and you can link to his social channels from there. And Landon Beach, you can go to Landon Beach Books. Dot com and you can link to his social channels from there. I'm at Jack Carr USA on the social channels, officialjackcar.com. That is the website. You can click on shop for the merchandise. And if you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Until the next time, take care out there. Stay safe, be strong, keep fighting. <laughs>